Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Sechas Erevin Daf Mem Tes begins by trying to determine the exact opinions of Rav Shimon and the Chachamim in a machokis about three chaseros that are lined up next to each other with partial Eruve chaseros between them. The Gemara is going to have two attempts two opinions as to what the actual machlokis is, and we're all bring a proof to one of them. These are quoted by Rav Yehuda in the name of Shmuel, and then we're going to get into a number of other halachos about multiple chatseris near each other with partial eruv chatseris, and then other halachos of Rav Yehuda in the name of Shmuel. This will take us to a Mishnah, and the Mishnah is near the end of the daf, which will introduce us to the halacha of somebody who's coming along the road, and he sees a spot further along, and he wants that spot to be to the center of his eruv, what he has to say, and what's the proper statement in order to make that his new say his new Arab center, his Makam Shvisa for Shabbos. So first of all, let's begin. The Gemara had the case of three Eruvi Chatseras that are near each other all in a row. Each one opens Sur Shasarabim. And the two outer Chatseras, the ones on the edges, made an Arab Chatseras with the middle Chatser. And the middle Chatser made an Arab Chatseras with the outer Chatseras. However, the outer Chatseras did not make a Chatser with each other. So we have a machogis between Rosh and the Chachamim, that much we know. We know that the outer Chatseris are not allowed to carry in each other's Chatser. The one all the way on the left can't carry in the one all the way on the right, and vice versa, because they don't have any outer Chatseris between them. The question is, what is the relationship between the outer ones and the middle ones? So there's three possible approaches, and there's two opinions. And the question is, where do these two opinions fit in which of these three approaches? Three approaches are as follows. The most strict opinion you could possibly have, we'll call this the third position, is that all three chatseras are forbidden on each other. Nobody's allowed to carry in anybody else's chatser. All the Eruvi chatseras are invalid. Not only are the outer two not allowed to carry in each other, the outer ones are not allowed to carry in the middle, and the middle ones are not allowed to carry in the outer. Now, a slightly lesser position than that, we'll call that position number two, is that the outer ones are allowed to carry in the middle chatser. This would be because they both set up their makam shvisa, they both set up their permanent residence in being in the middle chatser. So they both live in the middle chatser, they're part of a corporation which is the middle chatser, and therefore they all are allowed to carry in the middle chatser, they live there. However, the middle chatser guy can't carry in both of the outer ones, because he can only make his Erev chatseris in one or the other. You can't have your Erev chatseris in two places at the same time. You cannot set up your permanent residence in two separate places at the same time. Therefore, he couldn't carry in either of those two. That would be the middle position, position number two. And the most leaning position would be that, no, the outer two are allowed to carry in the middle chatzer, and the middle guy is allowed to carry in the outer chatzeros, because they all have a ruvi chatzeros between them, and therefore they're allowed to carry in each other's chatzeros. Now, according to Rav Yehuda quoting Rav, the most leaning position that everybody's allowed to do anything is the position of Rabbi Shimon, and the second position, slightly stricter than that, that only the outer two are allowed to carry in the middle, but the middle is not allowed to carry in the outer, that is the position of the Chachamim. According to Rav Yehuda quoting Shmuel, it's all one step further along. The middle position is the position of Rabbi Shimon, and the position of the Chachamim is the most strict Machmer position, the third position that nobody's allowed to carry in anybody's Chatzar. So the Gemara says that we could prove that Shmuel is correct based on a Brisa. The Brisa quotes a very similar case. The Brisa says that Rabbi Shimon says as follows. Uh, and again, he's referring to the uh, Mishnah we had seen earlier about the three people without any trum who have their four ama circles overlapping each other. But he says as follows. He says, this is similar to the case of three chatseris near each other. Um, that all open to Rosh Hashanah and the outer ones are made a chatser. Exactly our case, the outer ones are made in Chatseris with the middle one, and not vice versa. So the two outer ones are allowed to carry into and out of the middle Chatser, um, and uh, they're allowed to carry back into their own Chatser. So the, but he does not say that the that the middle Chatser is allowed to carry in the outer one. So you see he's holding the second position, this is Rabbi Shimon. Nachachamim say nobody's allowed to carry in anything. So this is exactly the way Rabbi Huda quoting Shmuel had said over this exact Machogus, and therefore it seems to support his position. Now, the Gemara understands that the basis of this is that Shmuel is holding that even Ravi Shimon has to agree that it's not possible for the middle Chatzar to have two separate Eruvi Chatzaris in two separate places. He can only have one Eruvi Chatzaris. 
You have an Erev Chatseris at one place, you can't have an Erev Chatseris somewhere else. Therefore, you can't carry in both Erev Chatseris. Somebody who does do an Erev Chatseris in two separate places has no Erev Chatseris. They're both valueless. So the Gemara says we can see this opinion of Shmuel elsewhere as well, because we have a Brisa that is a similar case, except slightly different. You have a Chatser, which, be- which is between two Mavoyes, between two alleyways. So the first halacha in the Brisa is that if he makes, if the middle chatzer makes an erev chatzer or shetufei uh, mavois with both mavois, the two mavois that border his chatzer, he has zero erev chatzer. Neither of them works. So that's his exact opinion. You cannot make any, um, you cannot make multiple eruv chatzer. You have to be stuck to only one. Okay, so that's that's where we see Shmuel fitting with his reasoning there. Rashi points out this has to be Rabbi Shimon's opinion because Shmuel Paskins you always go like the more lenient opinion in the halachos of Erevin, and therefore it couldn't be that this is the Chachamim's opinion, and really uh, Rabbi Shimon is more lenient. If Shmuel is bringing this price down, then he holds it Salach Maisa, and therefore it must be the more lenient opinion, which is Rabbi Shimon, and this Machlokas Rabbi Shimon is always more lenient than the Chachamim. Now, the Brisa continues, and this takes us into a bit more of a sugya. The Brisa says, what happens if he makes an Erev Chatseris with neither of the two Chatseris, with neither of the two Mavais? This is, again, the case of the Chatser, the sandwich between two Mavais, and he has a door into both of them. So first, we saw, we had seen before what happens if he makes an Erev Chatseris with both of them. Here, he made an Erev Chatseris with neither of them. So now, what ends up happening is that he's using both Mavais, and he has not made an Erev Chatseris with them. So the rule is, is that if any member of a joint uh, area did not join the Erev Chatseris, it's forbidden for everybody who uses that area to carry. So by this guy having a doorway into both Mavois and not having made an Erev Chatseris in either of them, both Mavois are totally forbidden for anybody who uses that Mavoy to carry in, because he didn't join the Erev Chatseris. Now what happens if he generally uses one Mavoy and he doesn't usually use the other Mavoy? So then we have a right to say that that's his Mavoy. And therefore, he's part of that Mavoy. And the other one, which he doesn't use, he's not part of that. And the fact that he didn't make an Erev Chatseris with them doesn't forbid them from being able to carry there. It's okay for them to carry there because he's not really part of that Mavoy. And the fact that he didn't make an Erev Chatseris doesn't make it forbidden for anybody else to carry there. However, if he does make one Erev Chatseris, that is his Erev Chatseris. And the other Mavoy, he's not part of that Mavoy anymore, even if the other Mavoy is the Mavoy that he usually uses. And then he made an Erev Chatseris with the Mavoy that he does not use Still, that becomes his permanent mavoy. That's what the, that's the mavoy that he's part of, and the one that he used to use all the time. By making an chaser somewhere else, he has ejected himself from using it. He's no longer part of that mavoy. He got himself out of it by making an chaser with the other mavoy, and therefore both mavoys are allowed to fully carry one because he's not part of it anymore, even though it was his former uh, thoroughfare, and one because he made a complete erev chaser with them. Now. What happens if the two Mavois, one makes an Erev Chatseris, and one doesn't bother making an Erev Chatseris at all? So the one that made an Erev Chatseris, if this guy didn't join them, they can push him to the other one. They can say, okay, he's going to be part of that Mavoy. He's not part of this Mavoy anymore, even if he generally was part of this Mavoy. And he didn't make any Erev Chatseris. But they can push him to the other one, because they can say, listen, you go join that Mavoy. Make that your permanent Mavoy. Why should you be part of our Mavoy, and then we won't be able to carry you should have joined ours. You didn't make an Erev Chatseris with us, so you go join that one now, be part of them, and leave us alone. And if he doesn't want to do that, the Gemara says that would be called Kaifin Amidas Sedayim. We would force him to do that, because he doesn't lose anything by doing that, and they gain by being allowed to carry from thence further. Okay, that concludes this discussion of Chatseris in a sandwich. Now the Gemara brings a number of other halachas of Rabbi Yehuda quoting Shmuel, and then one of Shmuel himself. So the first one is that somebody who is part of an Erev Chatseris, but he is very stingy about the bread that he gave to the Erev Chatseris and doesn't let any of the other members of the Erev eat the bread. Let's remind ourselves how an Erev Chatseris works. Uh, you have a Chatser or a Mavi, which is owned by a bunch of different people. You can't carry in it because it's owned by different people. The way to make it permitted to carry is to have all the people join together in a corporation all to set up a permanent uh, residence in one house. That'll be their corporation. And then that corporation owns the shared area. It owns the Chatzar. And therefore, the Chatzar is not owned by multiple owners. It's owned by one corporation. So if the the way to form the corporation is by having everybody contribute a piece of bread. So if the... And th- then they become partners in this basket of bread. So the Gemara says that, or the has the name of Shmuel, that if one of the members of the Arab doesn't let anybody else eat his piece of bread... So then, obviously, he's not contributing it. He's still stingy about it. So it doesn't count. It's not a good Erev. 
And he supports this by saying, look, the thing is called an Erev, right? Erev means mixed. So it has to be that you're mixed together with the others. You have shared equal rights and responsibilities. So you can't say, I don't let you touch my bread. Otherwise, it's not an Erev. You're not mixed together. So Gemara says, that's Rav Yehuda's opinion name of Shmua, but Rav Hanina disagrees. He says, no, it's fine. It's still an Erev, even if he's uh, stingy about it. It just makes him a stingy guy. He's from the people of Vardina. Those people were would not even allow their partners to eat uh, bread, they wouldn't allow them to use their assets in the partnership at all. Okay, next to Lachav Rav Yehuda, the name of Shmuel, if the breads are kept in two separate kalim, so it's not a valid Erev either, because it's not mixed together, it's called an Erev, it's got to be mixed together all in one. So Gemara says, wait a second, we had a machlok between Beis Shammai and Beis Hill on the subject. Beis Shammai said if it's in two kalim, it's not an Erev, Beis Hill said it is, so you see that Rav Yehuda, the name of Shmuel is going like Beis Shammai, how could that be? The Gemara says, no, 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 no. The Mechlekes Beis Hillel Meshameh was where it was all in one kli, but it overflowed. It didn't fit. So some of it went into another kli. That's an overflow. The Air Beis Hillel says that it still counts as an Erev, even though it's overflowing into a second kli. Here we're talking about where he there's no overflow. He stored it in two separate kalim because he wants it in two separate kalim. The Air Beis Hillel would not agree. Beis Hillel would say that that's no good. And therefore... Uh, Shmuel, who's saying that that's no good, is going like Beis Hillel, not just like Beis Shammai. Uh, that Machlokas is not relevant to this case. Again, there Machlokas was just by case of overflow. Now the Gemara says, these two halachas are Yehuda in the name of Shmuel, that if you're makbid, you don't allow anybody else to eat your bread, and your bread is split up, they're both playing on the fact that an Erev means mixed. So why do you have to tell me both halachas? I know that to, if I say one, I should know the other. An Erev has to be mixed. That has to be equally shared. Mor says, no, you do need them both, because the case of where it's split, it's that there's an actual physical split. So I may think that only where you have an actual physical split is there a problem, is it not a real corporation, it's not a real joint Erev. But if it's all in one clean, somebody just has his own ideas about who's allowed to eat his bread, so that won't make a difference. On the other hand, uh, I could see the logic the other way. In the case where somebody's actually mockbid, he's his problems, he doesn't want people to touch his bread, so therefore uh, then he's not joining this group. But if uh, he doesn't care, or just happens to be sitting physically in two separate kalim, why should that be an issue? And therefore, you have to tell me both halachas. Okay, now the Gemara brings another halacha here that Rav Abba said to Rav Yehuda in the wine press of Rabbi Zakai. He said, is it true that Shmuel said, he, he asked on what Rav Yehuda said, is it true that Shmuel said that if you divide your Erev into two, into two separate kalim, it's not an Erev? I'll prove to you that it's not correct. Because Shmuel said a different halacha. Shmuel said if you have a bunch of people making an Erev Chatseris, and they all bring a piece of bread, and they put it in one guy's house, that guy doesn't have to give a piece of bread. If it's in his house, he doesn't have to give a piece of bread. What must be the reason? The reason must be because he has bread in his own house. What does it make a difference if it's in the kli with all these pieces of bread, or if it's in his own bread basket? Who cares? Either way, this kli, that kli. So you see, it doesn't make a difference what kli it is. So how can you tell me that Shmuel says that if you store your Erev Chatseris in two separate kalim, it's no good? So if you'd answered him, he said, that's not, that's not the reason there. The reason is not because it doesn't matter what Kli it's in. The reason is because the entire way an Erev Chatseris works is that everybody sets their permanent residence in this house. So the guy who lives there, it's for sure his permanent residence. It doesn't have to make it his permanent residence by giving bread. It already is his permanent residence. That's why. It's not, it's not because he has bread in one Kli and a Kli doesn't make a difference. That's not how it works. Okay. Now the Gemara says... <clears throat> that uh, Shmuel says, uh, how does Erev work? The way Erev works, Shmuel says, is by buying a piece of the property. You give a piece of bread, in exchange for the piece of bread, you're buying a piece of the house, now you own the house. Everybody jointly shared owns the house, that becomes the corporation, and then the house, the incorporated house, owns the chatzar. And that's why you're allowed to carry in the chatzar. Now, the question then would be, why do you use bread? Why don't you, <laughs> why don't you use money? So Shmuel says the reason is because usually you make an Erev Chatseris on Erev Shabbos right before Shabbos, and who has money then in the pocket? Uh, so theoretically, you should be allowed to do it with money if you're stuck, you don't have bread, you should be allowed to use money. Um, the problem is, is, if we let you use money, people are going to end up using money uh, often, and then they'll forget that they're supposed to use, that they could use bread. Then what's going to end up happening is that when they don't have money, which is often going to happen because there won't often people don't have money around on Arab Shabbos, they're going to forget that there's such a thing as bread, that they're allowed to use bread. And then what's going to end up happening is that people are not going to do an Arab Chatseris altogether because they don't have money, because who has money in Arab Shabbos, and they forgot that you're allowed to use bread. Therefore, we said, always use bread.
Now, Rabbah disagrees with this whole thing. Rabbah says, no, the way that an heir of Chatseris works is not by buying a piece of the house. It's because, just like an heir of Tchumen, you set up your permanent residence where you keep your food. So here, too, you set up your permanent residence in the house where you keep your food. And therefore, you live in that house. You live in that house. That becomes your residence. Now you're part of the corporation that lives in that house. And that corporation owns the owns the yard, owns the chatzar. So Gamar says, what's the difference between these two explanations? Either way, it seems the same. And Gamar answers, there's three nafkaminas in halacha. Nafkamina number one is... If you can give something besides bread, if you can give non-food, can you give a shirt? Can you give a plate? So if the reason is because your your residence is where your food is, so this is not food. If the reason is because you're buying something, you can buy with a mm, plate. Thing number two would be, what if you give bread, but the bread is not worth a shava pruta. It's not worth a minimum size of coin. So if the reason is that you're buying, so it's no good, you have to buy with something that has value. If, however, you're just setting up your food, as long as it's enough food for two meals, it doesn't matter if, what, how much it's worth. And the other thing is, if a child is allowed to set it up for you, if he has to be buying something, a child can't buy things. However, if he's just bringing your food to be there, your food just has to get there. It doesn't matter how it gets there. So by you said, I have a kasha on both pshatim, both Shmuel and Rabbah. This is a brisa that says that you can have five people who set up an Arab Chatseris, then they want to move it somewhere else. So only one of them has to come and move it to a different house. So he says, what do you mean? Whether you're buying land or you're setting up residence, it would only be that guy's residence, only be that guy's house. How does it accomplish anything for the other four guys? So, so this is what he asked to Rabba, and Rabba said, it's not a kasha, not a me, not a shmuel. The guy's a shliach, he's a messenger. He's doing it on behalf of everybody else. The Mark concludes, the Rav Chama Bagira says, the halacha, in the name of Rav, the halacha is like Rabbi Shimon, back in the case of the uh, Chatseris, the three Chatseris lined up in a row. Okay, this is the end of this Gemara. Now we get to the next Mishnah, which talks about somebody's traveling along the road, and he realizes he's not going to get home before Shabbos. It's about to get dark, he's not going to get home before Shabbos. But he does see that there's a tree or a fence about 2,000 amas away from him, and that he knows that that fence is 2,000 amas away from his house. So he says, you know what? That tree should be my uh Erev Tchumen should be under that tree. That way he could go after Shabbos begins, he could go 2,000 amas to the tree and then 2,000 amas past that to his house. So it depends on the language here. If he says, under the tree is where my permanent residence is, my Makam Shvisa, the center of my Tchum, that's useless. That's no good. And the Gemara will have a whole Machok is why. If, however, he says, the root of the tree, that's a specific spot where that tree trunk meets the ground, there that works, and then he can travel 2,000 amas to that Root and then two thousand numbers further that to get to his house. Now, if he doesn't do this, either he doesn't know the halacha or he doesn't recognize any spot, then he ends up making his permanent residence where he is on the road, and then he only has two thousand numbers in every direction. How is this two thousand numbers work? According to the Tanakama, it's a circle, a radius of two thousand numbers in all directions. Therefore, in any direction he aims, he can only go 2,000 amas. According to Rechini ben Antignus, it's a square. He has 2,000 amas to the sides of the square, and then if he goes to the corner, he has longer than that. Because the corner will be the diagonal, it's longer, uh, and therefore he has further than 2,000 amas because of the fact that it's square-shaped and not round-shaped. Now, this halacha of making an area of where you are, the Gemara says it was set up for poor people because they can't afford to put food somewhere. So Rabbi Meir says it only works for poor people. Poor people could be somebody who's on the road who doesn't have any food with him, but it only works for poor mm, people. Uh, a regular person is supposed to put food, not supposed to go set it up by himself. However, Rabbi Meir, um, that's Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Huda says uh, it's for anybody. The only reason why we said it for poor people is because rich people could use food, but the point of rich people using food is to make it easier for them, not harder. Um, if they want to do it on their own to go, then they could. Okay, the Gemara now begins. The Gemara asks, when we send it, if the guy says that he's making his permanent Makmach Fisa under a tree, he doesn't say at the root of the tree, just says under the tree, that's no good. What does it mean it's no good? What's no good about it? So, Machlek is Rav Shmuel. Shmuel says that he gets a Makmach Fisa there, we just don't know where under the tree. The tree could have a, a, a shade area of 30, 40 amas. We don't know where. So therefore, we'll have to be machmer. Wherever he goes, we have to assume that the, his makam shvisa was the other end of the tree. Like, if he wants to travel north of the tree, we have to assume that his four amma makam shvisa is all the way on the southern end of the tree. We'll only have 2,000 amas from there, because we don't know where under the tree it was. We have to be l'chumra every spot. According to Rav, it doesn't work b'chlal. He has no makam shvisa. He has no trum, because he said an invalid language. He said under the tree. 
and it's no good. So he says, why not? What's the problem? So Mario has two explanations. One is that he didn't specify we are under the tree, and if you don't specify, it doesn't count. You have to say we are. The other one is that he did an invalid procedure. He tried to make the entire under the tree into a Makam Shvisa. You can't. A Makam Shvisa can only be four Amas. And he, this tree could be 30 Amas. You can't make something so big. Anytime you want to do something that's too big, it doesn't work. That's a rule called if you want to do something that if you would do it in stages, it wouldn't work. And if you try to do it all at once, it doesn't work. You can only do four Amas. If you want to do four Amas, then another four Amas, it's no good. So therefore, if you try to do more than four Amas, it's no good altogether. You can't do bigger than you're supposed to do. Uh, the Gemara wants to know what is the difference between these two opinions. The answer is the difference is, is if he says the specific thing. He says, I want my Mokmashvisa to be four Amas under that tree. So now it's still not specified. So if the problem is that it's not specified, this is also not specified and it's still no good. If ever the problem is that he's trying to do too big, here he's not trying to do too big. He just said four Amas under the tree. So therefore it would be. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzhak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.